So, there's more to the story, and I have more for you tonight. As I mentioned, these two were in a bitter custody battle, and there were court hearings after court hearings. And there was testimony. That testimony was recorded. I've got her testimony. Now, in this murder trial, we just had a stand your ground hearing. Um, we're waiting for the decision by the judge, but a lot of allegations were made. She never took the stand and testified in that stand your ground hearing. She did not testify, but she did testify in the custody hearing. And the allegations that she's making in the stand your ground and will make if it goes to trial in, in the self-defense case, they'll try to get in front of the jury, are going to be the same allegations that were made in the custody battle that went back and forth. Allegations that the judge, not a jury, but the judge found to be not credible. Judge did not believe her, did not believe her expert. But I want to play for you the testimony of Ashley Benefield. This is back in July of 2018 when there is a back and forth where she's trying to get uh, sole custody of their child. Let's take a listen. So the first time there was domestic violence between you and Douglas Benefield was when? Um, well, the first time that he, like, punched the wall wasn't April, but he started April of? Uh, 2017. So in April of 2017, he punched the wall during the course of an uh, argument or discussion, or what preceded the punching the wall? Um, he had sent me text messages with the kissing emoji, which I did not respond to, but I had responded to the rest of the conversation and he became offended that I hadn't responded in a loving manner to his emoji text message and so he came home from work early and I was in the bedroom and he came in and he immediately became very angry and started accusing me of not loving him and said that if I had loved him that I would have responded with a kissing emoji or a heart back and that um, he started accusing me of possibly having a relationship with somebody else. Um, said this just proved that he loved me more than I loved him. Um, I, of course, told him that, you know, none of that was true, but he became more and more angry. And he, um, at one point, like, walked, like, he had turned to walk away from me. And um, he was standing in the opening of the closet, and I was standing right on the outside of the closet and he turned around and he punched a hole through the wall with his fist um, and I was standing on the other side of the wall and the drywall literally came out and hit me in the face. Um, so how did a gun get involved in this discussion that the two of you were having? Uh, I don't remember what exactly triggered that point but he was sitting at the dining room table and I believe I was standing to his left, and he uh, pulled the gun out. I believe it was in his boot, um, and he pulled it out, and he started waving it around. Um, it was unholstered at the time, and I... And you're in front of him? I was to the side of him. Okay. So he's waving the gun around in your direction, or...? All over, because he was yelling as he was doing it. He was using his hands and holding it, and I, I started screaming, and I said, what are you doing? You've got to put that down. You're scaring me. Um, and so he actually pulled the trigger, but I do not believe there was a round in the Hold chamber. Sorry. When he pulled the trigger, where was the gun pointed? He pointed it at the ceiling. Okay. And it did not discharge, so he um, then threw the gun facing me, it missed me, it hit the wall behind me, and it punched a large hole, which is the um, third picture. The third the, page of the photograph? Yeah, it's patched, but that was the hole that had been um, okay. left in the, in the wall um, from when he threw the gun. And I, at that point, was crying and very upset and I told him he was scaring me and I don't remember exactly what happened but somehow I guess he stood up and he went around to the other side I believe he grabbed the gun I don't know if it was out of the wall or how how it got in his hand again um, but he then at that point um, I had 
tried to leave. I was I was headed towards the laundry room because I was afraid, and um, he started screaming. And he told me that this is a quote that he was going to blow his brains out. And so I stopped and I dropped to the floor and I started crying and I begged him to not shoot the gun. And he said that, he, that I was going to have to watch him shoot his brains out. And um, I was screaming and asking him not to. I told him I wouldn't leave. I was literally on my hands and knees. And he, um, I guess at some point, discharged the gun. I, I didn't see him aim it at the ceiling, but the bullet went into the ceiling. And then what happened? Um, I screamed, and you could smell, like, the smoke in the house. Um, Anybody call law enforcement? No. Did you, did you go on to have a party within days? Um, I believe it was about a week later. We had been planning, <coughs> since we'd gotten married, to have a celebration of marriage party, and all of my relatives from California had already bought their tickets, and everyone was coming. Why did you proceed to have that party after this event? because I was afraid and ashamed and I didn't want anyone to know what was happening. You start to live full time in South Carolina when? I would say in December of 2016. All right. And you're in fine health other than your hamstring recovery in December of 2016? Correct, yeah. And does your health take a downturn? It did. When did it start uh, having a downturn? Um, I would say by January I had started um, having weird symptoms. Uh, the first and most noticeable was just extreme fatigue. Okay. And did the extreme fatigue persist during, during the entire time from January of 2017 to the time that you stopped living with Douglas Benefield? It uh, sometimes was worse than others, but yes, it was pretty consistent from that time. And the day that you fixed that you moved out from his home was when? August 26th, 2017. Of 2017? Yes? Yes. Okay. And um, in the course of living with Douglas Benefield, would he um, serve you food or any anything that you would ingest into your body? He would. Um, he, we both enjoyed hot tea frequently. Um, so he had begun a habit of uh, bringing me breakfast in bed. Um, he would also multiple times during the day and a lot of times in the evening when he would go to bed, he would make me a uh, mug of hot tea to go to bed with as well. Okay. Was there ever anything about the tea that he would serve you that caused you concern? Yes. On multiple occasions, I told him that it didn't taste right. Um, it was a lot of times very sweet to the point where I was so nauseous. Um, I had gently tried to ask him to not make it so sweet because um, I like honey in my tea and so he would put honey in my tea um, and he multiple times got very upset and offended um, if I didn't finish the tea that he brought me he would get upset um, he one time I told him that I didn't feel well and I didn't want to drink it and he started yelling at me and he called me an ungrateful and said that I was lucky that I had a husband who would make me hot tea um, and that it proved that he loved me and that if I loved him that I would have just been thankful. Allegations that uh, she says uh, he was trying to poison me and the baby. All right, let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight, Seattle, Washington trial attorney, author of Justice in the Age of Judgment and fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and Bremner's with us. Also joining us tonight in West Palm Beach, Florida, former police lieutenant trial attorney Rick King, and in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor, professor of law at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling. Great to see everyone tonight. Ann Bremner, first question to you tonight. She has never told the story of what happened that night, no. the night of the shooting. Do you think she will be a good witness? Because I can't imagine her, no. if this goes to trial, I understand the stand your ground hearing is one thing, that if this goes right. to trial, she's going to claim self-defense in that moment and not get on the stand and tell her story. Do you think she'll be a credible witness? Uh, no. The answer is a resounding no. She's terrible. I mean, it's just she's banking it up as she goes along. And what's that vocal fry? Like, the, isn't that Belly Girl or some kind of rendition of it now? 
And do they have that in South Carolina? I think it's California usually, but she's she's terrible. I mean, she's especially he's going to poison the baby, and every time he's making her all this tea and emojis and everything else, and you're thinking, you know, what exactly is going on with this woman? I mean, she's a fantasist. All right, Rick King, let me ask you. Um, all this stuff came in during the, the, the prelim, I don't, uh, the, the stand your ground hearing, but at trial down in Florida, is the jury going to hear about the punch in the wall, the, the gun in the ceiling, the throwing of the gun, and allegations of poisoning the tea? Is the jury going to hear that if she testifies? Well, well the prosecution is going to try to keep it out, that's for sure. Right. Um, of course. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, so they're, they're going to claim that this is bad character evidence or propensity evidence, and they're going to try to keep it out. The defense is going to say that this is evidence that's, that, that is maybe it's, it's, it is, is motive or some, some sort of exception to that rule to be able to get that in. Um, I, I can't tell you right now because there's so much more to what she was saying that we're not going to, that we haven't heard right now, but I will tell you that I, uh, and this is where Ann and I kind of part ways. Uh, I, when I, I had not heard that testimony until just now, and I, for one, I thought that what she was saying was, and I'm putting on my criminal defense lawyer hat, I thought that what she said was somewhat compelling. Um, I don't know if it sees the light of day in the courtroom in the criminal case. However, to hear it now is compelling. And unlike the stand your ground hearing where you're, where the, you know, the, 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 the bulk of what you're going to see is in that pleading because the pleading itself can stand as the prima facie evidence of the of what your allegation is in the rapidly criminal trial you're going to need somebody to get up and talk about what happened so she's going to have to testify in that criminal trial because there's nobody else there to say what happened um and so i think that when you get to that criminal trial um the test of her testimony will will come to come to pass michael sterling former federal prosecutor criminal defense attorney this case, you get paid the same, okay? It has nothing to do with money. You get paid the same. You'd rather prosecute the case or defend the case? <laughs> getting paid in theory and getting paid in reality is two different <laughs> things, Benny. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you know, it, it, interesting. I, I'd probably rather defend the case. Uh, one, I don't particularly, I have a couple, I have one now, but I don't get a lot of criminal defendants who are women in murder cases. So, ballerinas? I it, it, I, I, certainly not ballerinas and swimsuit models. Uh, so, you know, uh, when you, when you have an opportunity on a case like that, it just seems like it would be a, a little bit more intriguing, a little bit more, you know, uh, intellectually challenging to be on the defense side of a case like this. Uh, certainly, uh, some of the evidence of the previous uh, allegations of abuse, some of the al allegations of previous uh, uh, forms of abuse may come into play, uh, as as Rick was talking about.